dear friends and colleagues, and thank you for joining today's combustion webinar. And I'm Peng Zhao from the University of Tennessee. And today is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Sveta Provo Chattery, and who is my colleague and a past colleague and friend. And Professor Sveta Provo Chattery is an associate professor at the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies and a visiting faculty fellow at the Department of Aerospace Engineering, IIT Margaret's. He works in turbulent reacting and multi-phase flows and has contributed to the understanding of turbulent flame stabilization, propagation, and structure using experiments, theory, and computations. He earned his PhD from the University of Connecticut. Subsequently, he worked at Princeton University as a research staff and then as a faculty member at the Institute, at the Indian Institute of Science. Professor Chaudhary has authored and co-authored over 100 articles in journals, conferences, and books, and has been honored by several organizations. He is an elected associate fellow of the AIAA and is a member of its propellants and combustion technical committee. Professor Chaudhary has also served as a member of the COVID-19 modeling consensus table an advisory body for the government of Ontario. Uh, with that, I would like to welcome Professor Sweta Provo Chowdhury and the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pong. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Pong Zhao and Professor Renting Sun for uh, organizing this talk. And my sincere thanks to the past and present organizers for uh, this wonderful initiative of this combustion webinar. So uh, I'm really honored to give a talk here. So let me share my screen. And uh, uh, today's, uh, the title of today's talk is Multiscale Complexities of Turbulent Reacting Flows. And we are going to look at uh, faster hydrogen flames under the impact of turbulence as well as some super spreading events. And I'll try to show that how uh, experience and knowledge of turbulent combustion can help us, us branch out into different areas and serve them. So uh, I am the principal investigator of the Propulsion and Energy Conversion Group. Uh, this is the group uh, uh, of the masters, PhD and PhD students and postdocs. It's a group of very, uh, competent, uh, technically sound, and uh, committed researchers. And uh, they look into different topics. The core focus of the group being uh, here, that is uh, uh, the flame turbulence interactions and flame speed enhancements under the impact of turbulence. Now, it is important to understand how uh, locally as well as globally turbulence enhances flame speeds like the displacement speed or the consumption speed, because uh, only then we can systematically design things like fuel flex combustors. Fuel flex combustors being uh, combustors that are proposed for gas turbine engines, which can work with say 100% natural gas or with 100% hydrogen. Now, as you know that natural gas versus hydrogen premix flames, they have a flame speed, the standard laminar flame speed of them can differ by a factor of eight almost. Uh, and the uh, turbulence can only exacerbate the such situations. They can only extend the, or, or widen this gap of flame speeds and flame uh, uh, propagation speeds. As a result, it becomes very difficult to design combustors which can work with such disparate fuels. And fundamental understanding of flame turbulence interaction and flame speed enhancements are required to systematically design. Not only that, I will show that the flame speed enhancements or how the mechanism of flame speed enhancements is, is uh, underpins phenomena like, uh, like uh, sound generation and uh, which can lead to thermoacoustic instabilities like synchronization and combustion dynamics, All right? And apart from this, we also look into non-combustion things like contrail formation, uh, as well as aerosol dispersion and disease dynamics. Now, combustion and not combustion, what unifies all these 
apparently diverse research topics is that all of them involve turbulence and reactions. We just love turbulence and uh, reactions, and we love turbulent reacting flows. And that this common theme, the common recurrent theme of turbulent reacting flows unifies all these apparently diverse topics. And not only in the, in the science of turbulent reacting flows, but also in the approach of looking at, looking at things at like small scales, for example, looking, looking into how locally turbulence can enhance the local flame speeds. And then we can try to understand how the interaction of turbulence builds up into global scale uh, flame propagation, like the turbulent flame speed. How local flame speed, speed can itself manifest in, in, a, in a larger scale into enhancement of turbulent flame speed over the local laminar flame speed. So uh, it is an approach we take for almost all of these uh, that we try to understand the phenomena at the micro and the meso scale, and then we see how turbulence interacts with them and that how those things lead to the emergence of a global phenomena in the form of uh, which, which, which can describe uh, things at a much larger scale. So that is the approach we take for all these different problems. Now today's talk will be focused mostly mostly on this flame speed enhancement and some part on this disease dynamics. And I'll show that how turbulent combustion research helps in those things as well. So uh, these works are supported by uh, different funding agencies and uh, partners like NSERC, like uh, Canada Foundation from, uh, for Innovation. And we partner with Siemens Energy, Pratt & Whitney Canada, McGill University, Polytechnic Montreal, IIT Madras, Kaust, and we are very grateful to have uh, the intellectual contribution of different collaborators and partners who really has enriched our work over the last decade or so. So uh, the first topic being uh, we'll, we'll look into uh, is essentially uh, the extreme variation in turbulent reacting flows and why do remix flame often propagate extremely fast in turbulence? What drives them to propagate extremely fast in turbulence locally? And then we'll also look at things globally. And we'll also try to look at things, look at this uh, question of this, why certain infectors cause uh, extreme number of infection and super spreading events. Now it's very, apparently these two are very disjoint, very widely different topics, but I'll, I'll establish the commonality in them sometime later. And then the question we ask is that, can we model this phenomena and their distributions? Is it possible? Okay. Now let's dive into uh, turbulent uh, premix flames. Of course, uh, in this audience, it is quite well known that turbulent premix combustion is ubiquitous in engineered and in the natural world. They occur in SI engines, gas turbine engines. Aircrafts are typically partially premixed, but they are going towards premixed. Uh, gas turbine engines, uh, uh, stationary power plants, industrial gas burners, paper cloud explosion, supernova 1A, all of these involve turbulent premix combustion at certain level. Okay, now uh, before looking into turbulent flames, let's start with the with a well-known structure, the beautiful structure of a standard laminar premix flame. This is the well-known structure of a standard laminar premix flame. Now, of course, under turbulence, this does not remain as pristine like this, but uh, it will be distorted at multiple length scales, at multiple time scales. Now, how do we analyze these distortions? The one possible way can be we can slice this structure up into several isoscalar surfaces. And we can try to analyze how these turbulent vortices, as you see this red turbulent vortices impacting on this, uh, on this uh, turbulent flame surface and stretching, wrinkling, and folding them at multitude of length and time scales. And uh, so the, the, the thing to understand here is that, that how does this uh, uh, vortices uh, generate uh, surfaces, how do they annihilate surfaces? As you see that the surface being continuously stretched uh, from this planar surface, it's being continuously stretched and it's continuously being annihilated at these trailing edges. So of course, if you want to understand flame displacement speed and this evolution in turbulence, we need to take into account how this stretching happens, how this folding happens, how this interaction happens between um, leading to this annihilation process. Okay, so the first uh, we look at uh, this question that if this is a turbulent flame surface, now this is, well, let's consider this as a fully developed turbulent flame surface. And we can see that this fully developed turbulent flame surface is being continuously annihilated due to flame flame interaction at these trailing edges. 
Now we know that even if this surface is being continuously annihilated, its statistical properties like this overall average surface area or the, the turbulent flame speed can remain statistically invariant even under this continuously destruction or continuous annihilation of the flame surface. So the question that pops up is that if the surface is being continuously annihilated in the trailing edges where it is being generated, there must be continuous uh, generation of the surface to support this continuous annihilation. Now, where does that happen? Okay, so turbulent flame surfaces are continuously generated and annihilated, but the exact locations on a surface that generate the completely new surfaces are not known a priori, okay? And to do that, to know where the surface is being generated, we need to look back in time. Okay, so the first question is that where do fully developed complete turbulent from its flame surfaces evolve from? And what are the special features of these generating locations? Okay, so once again, the question is that these surfaces as we see is being continuously destroyed in these trailing edges. And uh, to support that, the surface must be continuously generated somewhere. The question is that where is it being generated from? And uh, that, that is a question we try to address. So, and then the, then the question is that how do flame surfaces generate and annihilate? What drives this generation and annihilation processes? And what implication does this generation and annihilation hold for the local flame displacement speed, LT? Okay, as we will see that, that this really has a very big impact on the local flame displacement speed, so generation and annihilation processes. So uh, to, do, to answer such questions, we'd look at DNS because of the detailed nature of the data that is available. We can have DNS data of all, all velocity, of all components of the velocity of all the species at, uh, if, we, if, we do a if we use a detailed reaction mechanism uh, at very fine time intervals. So that's why we look at DNS. Uh, so uh, we look at statistically planar uh, uh, hydrogen air flames at say equivalence ratio 0.81 at one atmospheric pressure, and we use detailed reaction mechanisms so as to avoid any artifact of modeling uh, the reaction mechanisms. Okay, and these are moderately uh, Karlovitz moderately intense turbulent flames we are looking at around the Karlovitz number of about uh, 16 to 15. Okay, so uh, these are in the thin reaction zone regime, and the DNS approach that we take is that we generate isotropic turbulence in a box, and then we feed that isotropic turbulence into a cuboid where a planar flame is stabilized with a mean velocity. So this isotropic turbulence with a mean velocity goes and interacts with this turbulence flame. It stretches, folds, wrinkles, annihilates the surface at different length scales. And then this, we can, we can uh, look into what is going on, what leads to annihilation, what leads to generation, and answer these questions. Now, uh, first of all, this just having the DNS is also not enough to address the question where the surface is being, is being generated from. To do that, what we do is that we spread particles called hypothetical particles called flame particles on the entire surface and track them. Okay. And the flame particles are essentially mathematical points that co move with the local isotherm, that always co moves with the local isotherm. And that is ensured, this co movement with the local isotherm is ensured by, 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 uh, by uh, solving this equation where the position vector of the local flame particle, uh, the rate of change of the position vector of the local particle evolves as the local fluid velocity vector plus place flame displacement speed times the local normal vector. And of course, the flame displacement speed is the speed with which a flame surface propagates locally relative to the local fluid flow velocity in the direction of the local surface normal vector. Now, this flame particle tracking approach uh, basically is looking at the surface at even a closer, uh, from even closely, that first we basically decompose the entire flame structure into surfaces. And then we are looking at, instead of looking at the surface, we are looking at the points. And the idea is that if we, this, this, this entire, if we can look into a large number of points that span the surface and a large number of such surfaces, we can completely describe what is happening for the entire flame. Okay, now as we said, the goal is to understand what happens, where is the surface generated from? So to do that, to answer that question, we need to look at the surface, and look at uh, the evolution of the surface characterized by the evolution of these flame particles back in time. Now, the flame particle tracking is very useful in that sense because you cannot track DNS fields back in time just like that. 
I mean, the DNS fields are obtained by solution of the momentum species energy equations, and they all involve diffusion terms. And as you know, the diffusion terms does not allow time reversal symmetry. As a result of that, you cannot integrate those, uh, those fields back in time. But what you can do is that you can this, you can produce reconstruction algorithms for this flame for the position of the flame particles, and that can take you back in time to tell you where the surface basically evolves from. It involved a detailed development of algorithm, uh, and uh, my former PhD students and master students, Himanshu and Abhinesh, did a fantastic job in forming this backward flame particle tracking algorithms. So what happened is that you take two isosurfaces like this, as uh, this say this 350 Kelvin isosurface and this 1100 Kelvin isosurface, you distribute flame, particle flame particles on these surfaces uniformly. And then you track these flame particles back in time. And what happens when you track them back in time is that these uniformly dispersed flame particles tend to cluster at specific locations. Now, these are not random locations where they cluster. They cluster in these specific locations, and these specific locations are characterized by the fact that they are the most forward uh, portions of the flame, and they are also positively curved. So these most uh, leading and these positively curved locations of the flame basically serve as the generating locations of the entire flame surface at a later time. And this is what you see uh, here is that if you now play this forward in time, you can see that these leading uh, positively curved locations of the flame surface basically dis uh, basically stretch to generate the complete flame surface at a later time. Okay, now this, uh, this is quite remarkable for turbulent flames and uh, because in these papers, there's Zeldovich as well as in paper by Lewin, it was shown that for laminar flames, this concept of leading point source but often these, these kind of, uh, the, what Zeldovich said is that he used this for a laminar flame and he came up with the concept of a single leading point. But in turbulent flames, what you see is that there is no single leading point. There is this ensemble of leading regions which basically stretch and they are, they are stretching due to both uh, prop, flame propagation as well as tangential straining leads to the generation of the complete surface at a later time. And this is how it happens. Uh, we, we basically create the statistics, and uh, here we have put a cartoon to explain what is happening, that at the very earliest times when the curvature is very large, the, the surface generation is dominated, it is dominated by just stretching due to curvature. The flame propagation controls that uh, stretching process itself, and then eventually the surface tangent aligns with the most extensive component of the uh, strain rate uh, um, uh, of the most extensive component of the tangential strain rate. And uh, as a result of this, this alignment, if this preferential alignment, uh, the, uh, the turbulence can uh, strain uh, the surface along its tangent, and that leads to the growth of this surface. And multiple such finite size surfaces basically join together, and that leads to formation of the complete surface at a later time. And we can we have also shown that if you look at these generating uh, flame particles or these destructing flame particles, that is, if you start distribute the flame particles completely over the entire surface, they will destroy because of flame flame and flame flame interaction at some later time. And both of them follow this bachelor sphere dispersion law uh, with modified coefficients. And so this allows us to basically describe this generation and destruction of these flame surfaces quite accurately. Now, what implication does this have, this flame particle tracking generation annihilation have for flame displacement speed, which is a topic of interest? Now, uh, first of all, flame displacement speed uh, is very important in turbulence because it allows us to understand flame stabilization and blow off, flashback. These are important if you want to generate, if you want to create a, design a combustor, which will, uh, which will, house, uh, which will house a flame uh, fueled by hydrogen or natural gas. Uh, it is important to understand combustion dynamics. It is important to understand turbulent flame speed. So flame displacement speed underpins a wide range of phenomena that is of interest in, uh, in, in gas turbine engines. Now, if you look at flame displacement speed, uh, the scatter plot of flame displacement speed and normalize it by the standard laminar, corresponding standard laminar flame speed, and plot it as a function of the stretch Colovis number, 
what we will see is a, is a wide scatter, is a widely varying scatter plot like this. Okay, it can go of the order of factor of 80. Indeed, here the density weighting is not uh, in, implemented. As a result, the density plays a big role in creating this factor of 80. But even if you remove the density variation, you can be sure that this we will see a factor of 10 variation of the flame displacement speed as a uh, when you know, when you compare it with the corresponding planar laminar flame speed. Now, this is well known. That's a big scatter exists in when you look at the flame displacement speed in turbulence. It's well known. Now, uh, what is not apparent from this joint PDF is that that this instantaneous uh, snapshot, which is characterized by a scatter plot or a joint PDF, does not tell you what causes these big variations in the flame displacement speed. Okay, and that is where things like flame particle tracking, where you can track the flame in time, track specific locations of the flame in time, can become very helpful. So, uh, if you uh, so. We will see that uh, that that turns out to be helpful. And to do that, what we do now is that we start from these leading generating locations of the flame surface. These flame particles, as you see now, evolves from this leading generating locations of the flame surface. They span the entire surface, but you don't stop now. We can we'll allow these flame particles to be tracked further in time, such that they eventually annihilate due to flame-flame interaction at these training edges, OK? So once again, if I show this video, we now basically track these uh, generating flame particles, which starts from these leading positive bigger regions. We allow this tracking to continue uh, uh, so that they can span the complete surface. And then uh, eventually, these flame particles uh, interact, uh, these flame locations interact with themselves to annihilate in the trading regions of the flame. So uh, this allows us, so what, this is what we are doing. We are starting from say TF, where we have an uniform distribution of flame particles. We do backward flame particle tracking so that we land up at TI, where the clusters of flame particles aggregate in this uh, leading regions. And then we do a forward tracking from TI all the way to TE, the time ending time, where the flame particles land up in the trailing regions and annihilate. The idea is that if you study a large number of these flame particles, you create a manifold of states that basically contains all possible states of the turbulent flame for that inlet condition, or for that inlet and ambient conditions. That is, given the flame, same uh, Reynolds number, Kolovich number, you create all possible states of the turbulent flame that can happen in this, uh, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, embodied by this set of uh, flame particles. It's almost like a basis vector we, using which we can create any, any other vector. So this is the advantage now we have by looking at these flame particles all the way from the generation to the annihilation. Now, what happens if we look at now the, the property of interest that is flame displacement speed? Now, in these three plots, which correspond to, correspond to, correspond to the flame displacement speed or the normalized density weighted flame displacement speed, the normalization factor being the, uh, the, the standard planar laminar flame speed, for, we look at three isotherms extracted from the flame, 350 Kelvin, 665 Kelvin, and 1321 Kelvin. We plot in each of these, we plot from uh, plot in normalized time, T normalized by tau FL, tau FL being the flame particle lifetime, okay? And we plot two different kind of quantities. One is the instantaneous uh, flame dis normalized flame displacement speed for three random particles uh, characterized by i, j, and k. That is these uh, these dashed lines or these chain dotted lines. And uh, we then have this averaged, the ensemble averaged uh, uh, normalized flame displacement speed, the ensemble averaging being done on the entire set of flame particles. Okay, so uh, this, basically contains the entire information of the evolution of the local flame displacement speed right from the generation location, which corresponds to T by tau F equal to zero, and all the way to the annihilation location to T by tau F equal to one. Okay, so uh, what we see is that that for most part of the of their lifetime, the ensemble averaged or for the individual flame particles, their flame displacement speed, the density weighted flame displacement speed does not change too much from one. It stays one for the most of the time, okay? Then beyond about 80% of their lifetime, the flame displacement speed shoots up 
uh, into very large values to almost a factor of four, uh, six, or uh, almost eight. So this is kind of uh, happens for all flame particles uh, and also reflected in their averages on their ensemble averages. And it happens for all isotherms invariably. That is for most of their lifetime, the flame displacement speed does not change too much from one. Uh, the normalized flame displacement speed does not change too much from one, but towards the end of the lifetime, it becomes, uh, it shoots up into very large values. So uh, from this, we can segregate the lifetime of flame particles into two phases. The phase one, where the variations of local flame displacement speed are mild and gradual, and phase two, from 80% of the lifetime to about 100%, we can say that the variations in the flame displacement speed are large and drastic. Okay, so what is happening? First, let's look at the, the first 80% where the variation is mild. And we can test out this uh, the, the, the two Marston length steady stretch at models in this kind of a situation, because they also do not vary too much from one. And it turns out that in this phase, that is from zero to eighty percent of the lifetime, the stretched, uh, the steady stretch, uh, um, uh, two marks in length models work actually well, and they can describe almost quantitatively the variations of the flame displacement speed, okay, for individual particles as well as for the ensemble average. Uh, but, uh, yeah, somebody raised uh, asked a question. Well, please type out your question using the chat function and we will ask a speaker later. Thank you. Okay, all right, sure. So uh, so uh, this uh, individual part, we can see that uh, this, uh, these, these three equations, equation two, three, and four as seen here, these are different forms of the same thing. Uh, the, the two Markstein length stretch rate model uh, proposed by Bechtel, Matalon, and then from by, uh, refined by Giancopoulos uh, and Matalon. Okay, so this works quite well in these uh, zero to eighty percent of the phase of the of phase. Now, if you plot the error of the DNS data and the theoretical prediction, and say in the two different phases from zero to eighty percent and from eighty percent to hundred percent, we can see and compare. Basically, the the DNS data is the DNS data, and the this is the theoretical is basically the prediction by Matalon's two marks in length model, we can see that the error remains very well bounded within about 20 to 10 to 20%, depending on the equation I use for these zero to 80% of the lifetime of the flame particles. Whereas in the last portion, in this 80 to 100% of the lifetime, this error really shoots up and becomes unbounded, okay? It becomes like, it goes to about 200%. So uh, clearly from this, we can say that at least for these moderately uh, intense turbulent flames, this even the steady stretch rate theory is derived for laminar flames works pretty well in this zero to 80% lifetime, but really does not work in this 80 to 100% of the lifetime. So what is going on here? Okay, what goes on is actually flame-flame interaction that we can see uh, happening from this uh, annihilation of the flame particles itself. And these, air, these flame speed shoots up in this region and that really cannot be captured by these steady stretch rate models because of the nature of the flame flame annihilation itself. Here we have plotted like in three, the, these are uh, contours, these two dimensional contours. And like in this uh, green and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the blue boxes captured this flame flame interaction events. Now, as you see that they are characterized, the, if you look at the timestamps, you can see that this flame flame interactions events are very, very fast, okay? This, uh, it happens within like a 25 microseconds, which are even faster than the turbulent scale, time scales. And because it is very fast, they are inherently the phenomena is transient in nature. As a result, we cannot even expect that the such highly transient uh, events uh, to be described by the steady stretch rate uh, uh, flame speed models. We need something else for that. Now, uh, anyways, summarizing, uh, we'll come to that. That we what we can what we can what we can uh, the take home message is that for even for modulated turbulent flames, uh, uh, there are portions where the local flame structure is reasonably close to that of a thermal uh, that of a laminar flame structure, and that's why the flame lit models work. Okay, uh, but these are for moderate, moderately turbulent flames. Whereas in these uh, in these regions where the flame is interacting with itself. Of course, the flame structure is widely different than that of a standard laminar flame structure. 
it obtains a V shape. This uh, this the temperature profiles becomes V shaped because there is flame frame interaction, and uh, we, we cannot expect the steady stretched models to be of use there. All right. Now this is the structure for moderately uh, turbulent flames. So in the what hap what happens if you make the turbulence intense and disturb the internal flame structure? This, does flame flame interaction go away? The answer is no. So in this top uh, uh, contour, what we see is that these uh, high Reynolds number, low Karlovitz number flame, and these contours are colored by the density, the normalized density weighted flame displacement speed. Okay, and we can see that that in these uh, high Reynolds number, low Karlovitz number flames, the isotherms remains reasonably parallel to themselves, and uh, in these flame flame interaction, even in these flame flame interaction regions. Basically, the flame displacement speed shoots up as expected, as as provided by the flame particle tracking uh, um, results. But even then, the flame flame interaction happens. Uh, basically, these these flames interact, and these flame flame interaction events happen together. This can be called, considered that the entire flame interacts with itself. All the isotherms interacts with their corresponding isotherms at some time at at in uh, around the same time. But for a high Reynolds number, highly Karlovitz number of flames, where your flame surface is, flame structure is highly distorted, the flame's isotherms does not remain parallel to each other. And as a result, the flame flame interaction becomes a highly localized event. Okay. Here also, you can see that when the curvature is very large, when there is flame flame interaction, the local flame displacement speed is shooting up. But here, the flame flame interaction does not happen over the entire flame structure, it happens at a very localized uh, 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 level in which uh, one or more isotherms basically interact with themselves. But that does not mean the flame flame interaction has gone away. Flame flame interaction is still ubiquitous. Actually, it is even more uh, predominant in this high Karlovitz number case than this low Karlovitz number case, as you see in this uh, in this contour itself, that the flame displacement speed and, uh, and flame flame interaction is happening even more uh, in this uh, high Karlovitz number cases. Now, can we model this flame, flame, flame speed at flame flame interaction for this kind of widely disparate uh, Reynolds number, Karlovitz number? Where do we even begin? First, if you have to model, you need to choose a configuration. Now, what kind of configurations you choose? Now, if you look into the literature, you can find that, that flame structures, flame elements with very large curvature are essentially cylindrical in nature. And that, that, is, that holds true for material surfaces in turbulence because they are they basically fold along nearly straight lines. And if you look into the principal curvatures, which you can obtain by uh, doing an eigenvalue problem on the Hessian matrix, uh, if you can extract the eigenvalues from the Hessian matrix, uh, the local, the two principal curvatures, you will see that, that at very large curvatures, at very large mean curvatures or very large local curvatures, very large negative mean curvatures are contributed by only one of the principal components. And that is apparent from this JPDF, and that is mostly true for even high Karlovitz number planes. And as a result, the configuration that we can choose to describe these high, cur high curvature flame flame interaction events can be a simple transient cylindrical flame. Okay, And this is the transient cyl cylindrical flame we can analyze. And uh, this is the configuration that we can choose that we have a basically a transient uh, or an unsteady uh, cylindrical flame. Now, the unsteady is a very important feature of these calculations or the or the or the model because, as you have seen, that the that the flame flame interaction is a highly transient event, and that can be seen from these temperature profiles itself. Now, these are uh, so one d simulations of this uh, of this configuration. As you can see, that for this imploding cylindrical flame, where the flame is basically uh, imploding onto itself, this radius normalized by the flame thickness, it's a very very small flame. Which is imploding onto itself, you can see that the temperature profile varies drastically, and uh, basically, it's the, the temperature profile vanishes because of flame flame interaction. So the the goal is to basically obtain the flame displacement speed as these temperature profiles vanish and the flame annihilates. Okay, and as you see that this is of the order of again 50 microseconds, consistent with what we see for the turbulent flame happening over a period of this kind of very short uh, uh, time intervals. But the important nature, as I said, is that the, the feature of this analysis is that it's, it, this type of analysis must be unsteady. It cannot be dealt with in a steady uh, flame structure, uh, which is typically used for steady stretch rate theories. Now, uh, we, can, we can basically set up the equations as transient uh, flame and analyze the preheat zone. And uh, 
what we can come up, I'll not go into the details, is basically a simple solution for Lewis number equal to one, is that the local flame displacement speed is minus two times the th thermal diffusivity times the curvature. Okay, it's just a very simple equation uh, that can be, that we can arrive at. And then we can test out how this simple equation of flame displacement speed during flame flame annihilation holds up in, in these complicated cases. So we took a look at different uh, points uh, in the regime diagram. This work is in collaboration with Hong. Uh, and um, if this F1 is basically a high Reynolds number, low Karlovitz number case, F2 is a high Reynolds number, high Karlovitz number case that we have shown before. P3 and P7 are two uh, moderate and reasonably high pressure cases that we'll be looking at. So uh, first, if you look at the joint PDF of this high Reynolds number, low Karlovitz number case for an uh, for a progress variable point 0 0.05. And uh, if we have along the x-axis normalized curvature and along the y-axis, we have normalized flame displacement speed, okay? Normalized density weighted flame displacement speed so that you can take off the, the large variation contributed by density itself. So this is density weighted flame displacement speed divided by the standard planar laminar, laminar flame speed. These are all hydrogen air flames and uh, at an equivalence ratio of about 0.8. Uh, the Lewis number is slightly less than unity, but not too much less than unity. It's about 0.85, uh, uh, 0 .0 around 0.8, the, the, Lewis, the effective Lewis number. So uh, if we look into the, uh, so the, the colors, the, con the color contours represent the, the log of the joint PDF. The black line represents the model. We have added an SL uh, to basically describe the intercept. But as you see here, the, the model that we have obtained from this uh, analysis is, is presented here. The density weighted frame displacement speed is essentially the SL minus two alpha naught tilde kappa. Uh, one of the simulations is represented by this, uh, this line with circles. And the conditional mean of this joint PDF is represented by this blue curve. Okay, so this blue curve represents a conditional mean and this black line represents a model. So we can see that the, that the, the, the agreement is uh, qualitatively good and quantitatively also it's not uh, too bad given the complexity of the problem. So what happens at, uh, this is at low Karlovitz number uh, for a low Karlovitz number flame where the flame surfaces are reasonably uh, parallel to themselves. What happens at high Karlovitz number flames? This is the joint PDF and the corresponding, uh, the conditional mean of the, of the high Karlovitz number case, uh, we can again see that this the 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 model and the and the blue line are reasonably close to each other, and this is uh, basically quite encouraging, and uh, shows that this uh, flame flame interaction model can uh, describe uh, at least qualitatively the overall trends of the of the evolution of the density weighted flame displacement speed uh, as a function of curvature, and this if you look into the all the different uh, Isotherms, so these are all the, the 0 0.05, 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06. These are all different isotherms. And uh, from the different cases, F1, low Reynolds number, uh, low Karlovitz number, uh, high Reynolds number, high Karlovitz number case. F2 is the high Reynolds number. Um, F1 is the, sorry, F1 is the uh, high Reynolds number, low Karlovitz number case. F2 is the high Reynolds number, high Karlovitz number. P3 is the high Reynolds number, uh, three bar atmospheric pressure. P7 is the seven bar atmospheric pressure, all turbulent flame cases. And in all of them, the model is represented by the black line and the joint PDF by the contours and uh, the, the conditional mean by the blue line. So you can see that in some cases the, where essentially downstream, where you have intense uh, heat release, the, 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 this, these blue lines kind of deviate. But overall, the, the, the comparison of this, of this, the overall trends of these blue lines with the flame flame interaction model of the simple model which just contains this SL minus two alpha naught tilde kappa is very encouraging. One more important feature, uh, the notable feature is that as you see that uh, as we go to higher and higher isotherms, the blue line, the slope of the blue line increases. And that is also captured by the increasing slope of the black line because of the increasing uh, density weighted thermal diffusivity itself. So this simple uh, uh, flame uh, uh, speed curvature model can essentially qualitatively explain what is happening at large negative curvatures uh, for these density weighted flame displacement speeds. 
Now, what happens at other fuels? Uh, so uh, we looked into this in this recent paper with uh, my colleague at Polytechnic Montreal, Bruno Savard. And uh, these are like n heptanear unit Lewis number, high color Lewis number, turbulent premix flame. Once again, color represents joint PDF, black line represents model, and blue line represents conditional mean. And we can see that that this uh, works, uh, this, this model works pretty well. Okay. And the reason why it works pretty well is that because uh, flame flame interaction, of course, it is influenced by, by the actions, but uh, to the leading order, flame flame interaction is basically a transient diffusion, heat diffusion problem. Okay. Where the, where the flame, where the gradient basically homogenizes. And uh, of course, the, pre, the, the structure of the preheat zone is important, but this, this homogenization of the gradient is strongly dependent on curvature. Okay, and that is captured, accounted for in the model, and uh, both, and as a result of which, it becomes successful in explaining this uh, flame displacement speed trends at large negative curvature over this wide uh, range, uh, over these different ranges. Now, what happens with other configurations? Uh, if you look into the Bunsen flames, uh, uh, very intense Bunsen flames, uh, this data comes from uh, Mohsen Talai from University of Melbourne. And uh, if you look into once again the joint PDFs, the conditional means, and here we see that uh, that uh, this this uh, this uh, sometimes the ma match is not as good, uh, but qualitatively once again we see that the the basic features of this increasing slope with increasing uh, with increasing as we go deeper into the flame is captured by the model, and uh, qualitatively once again the model reasonably well captures the. The, the basic trends, the mean, uh, the conditional means of this flame displacement speed, uh, uh, the, the conditional mean of this uh, JPDFs uh, reasonably well. We're still looking into this. This data needs a little bit more refinement in the sense that we need to, this, this, uh, this fluctuation should vanish if we have average over a larger number of uh, cases. Okay, so what we have tried to establish is that, that this, uh, though there's much, much refinement that can be incorporated into this model, we can, we have not taken into account like merging of the reaction layers in this model, so those kind of things can improve the 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 the, the this kind of uh, matches. But overall, the the simple flame flame interaction model that we derive for a unsteady cylindrical flame works reasonably well for uh, for a wide range of fuels as well as for a wide range of configurations. Now, whether it is universal or not, that remains to be seen. Whether it uh, whether uh, for different even higher Coulomb's number different configurations and uh, uh, impact of Lewis number, for example, is a big thing that we can look at. But why is this important? This is important because flame flame annihilation holds important implications in sound generation. As you see that as the flame annihilates here in the simple Bunsen flame under uh, oscillating stretch rate, as it, uh, as it annihilates, it uh, there is a there is a flame surface fluctuation there is a heat release fluctuation and as a result of which it sends out a pressure fluctuation which comes from the Helmholtz equation itself okay uh, and uh, as a result this the sound waves propagate and we believe that this holds important implications of uh, in in describing uh, organized uh, pressure fluctuations that can manifest as thermoacoustic instability. So that is one important thing that can be looked at and where uh, such flame displacement speed modeling can be useful. And uh, things like this, for example, in this uh, flame, we see that when there is flame, when there is thermoacoustic instability in this left uh, image, where there is strong interaction with this uh, with these flames, and uh, and these leads to a lot of heat release fluctuation, which leads to pressure fluctuations. And in a confined environment, this kind of organized pressure fluctuations can lead to thermoacoustic instability. Here we see, for example, these uh, flame-flame interactions are not synchronized, and this flame does not undergo any kind of thermoacoustic instability. The other things where flame speed, flame displacement speed modeling uh, can be useful is where turbulent flame speed, uh, where, where in, in case of turbulent flame speed, then you can define actually the turbulent flame speed based on average mass flow rate to all the isotherms, uh, where the turbulent flame speed is equal to uh, the local uh, 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 the flame draft thickness and then the local flame displacement speed times the uh, gradient of the local progress variable. And we can have a closure for Lewis number equal to one, but it remains to be seen what happens for Lewis number not equal to one. And then you can invoke the scalar dissipation anomaly to show that the, for Lewis number equal to flames, uh, it can indeed approach a Reynolds number to the power of half scaling. 
So this, so this is uh, what we have been doing uh, on uh, flame displacement speed and turbulent flame speeds. And uh, we have just, uh, we don't have too much time, but I'd just like to finish the discussion with some thoughts on, on COVID-19 and how uh, combustion research can translate into some of interesting findings in COVID-19. So this is uh, several things that we have been looking at since the beginning of the pandemic, like uh, uh, developing models based on um, droplet uh, uh, evaporation and uh, droplet aerosol dispersion. And now one of the very important things about COVID-19 is the, is the fact that uh, people believe, uh, and uh, there is evidence also that super spreading drives the COVID-19 pandemic, okay? Now, super spreading means that uh, that one of uh, one infector um, uh, uh, due to special properties in the form of like high infectivity can infect several people, whereas there can be many infectors who does not infect several people who may not even infect anyone. Okay, so this wide disparity is the reason why uh, a pandemic can spread, and this is reflected in the in if you plot uh, the histogram of the number of secondary cases and uh, you can see that per infector that is how many secondary cases one infector induce it emerges as a long tail distribution now in turbulent combustion we are always fascinated by long tail distribution where does it come from scalar dissipation rate like has a long tail distribution and uh, things like that okay so uh, this has been a very important question that wh what is the source of this uh, uh, these long tail distributions and why is super spread why does super spreading events happen so the the, the statistical uh, explanation statistical description of a super spreading event is through these long tail dis dis distributions and can we obtain a model for these long tail distributions so if you have a configuration like this where we have uh, one infector and n susceptible and an infector behaves like a continuous point source then turbulent diffusion governs the aerosol concentration field in this one particular case. And then the idea is that we look into this one particular case and then we create a statistics of this, of several such cases. And from that, we can obtain the distributions, including the, the different variations of things that, that causes the aerosol concentration variation, like viral load, like number of people in the room, the room size, ventilation rates, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so uh, we looked into this problem by taking into account data, occupancy data from, we obtained occupancy data at different US restaurants from the cell phone data, uh, anonymous cell phone data. We looked into particle size distribution of the exhaled aerosol. We looked into viral load distribution. Now, one of the important, once again, a long tail feature that emerges is this viral load distribution, which represents a number of virus copies that is present in a given volume of uh, mucosalivary fluid. And we were amazed to see that this viral load can, can obtain really wide uh, variations. It can be, say, from one uh, virus particle to of the order of 10 to 12 virus particles in one milliliter. And, you know, of course, this is one of the reasons why you have uh, large uh, long tail distributions itself. But that is not the end of the story. There is an important uh, uh, combustion aspect to it in the sense that the way these kind of infections are modeled or the probability of infection is modeled is through an equation like this, which is called the dose response model. And uh, if you, this dose response model can be, or that this probability of infection can be considered equal to the attack rate, that is number of people infected per unit, total number of people. And uh, this NV is the number of virus particles inhaled, which can be proportional to the viral load. This RV is the dose response constant. And if you plot this as a function of viral load, immediately we, what the feature that emerges is uh, something once again like that of a premix flame structure. And uh, the, this emerges because once again, it has this, this viral load plays kind of the role of a temperature and this RV plays the role of an activation energy. And as you know, that in, in a premix flame, you have a very narrow premix flame because of the large activation energy. So this RV, once again, this nature of this RV creates this kind of a behavior and at the end of the day, as you see that that uh, this attack rate itself, for a lot of uh, for a large range of viral load, this attack rate is close to zero. Okay, whereas immediately after certain after crossing a threshold, it becomes one. So this narrow region where of where this transition happens is once again response the 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 thing or the parameter that controls this narrow region is this dose response cons constant which is similar to the activation energy that we see in chemical reactions okay so this this equation itself can be considered the the reaction equation 
And once again, the rest can be considered as the turbulent uh, dispersion thing that we that we look at. So uh, what we could do is that we could obtain analytical equations for these uh, for the distribution of the uh, number of uh, infectors, uh, and we came up with this equation. It's it's uh, it's complicated, but, uh, but but it contains all the all the basic features. For example, H contains the 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 the, the distribution of the number of uh, occupants uh, inside a given room. Uh, this uh, Z is the number of infected uh, people, N is the number of occupants. Uh, it contains this uh, mu and sigma depending on the you know, viral load distribution itself and all other factors like ventilation, uh, uh, virus uh, lifetime being embedded in this constant alpha. And we did a Monte Carlo simulation and we could show that these, these long tail PDFs that obtained from the, long, of the, from the Monte Carlo simulations could be explained by this GZ, this, this uh, analytical equation that we obtained uh, using this concept of, uh, of reaction uh, controlled by activation energy. In this case, uh, dose response constant. Okay, so uh, this was, uh, uh, we were quite uh, interested in this. Uh, it, it, this could capture, uh, uh, we, could, we could arrive from essentially first principles uh, an analytical expression of how this long tail distribution uh, emerges. And we could show that this, uh, this over dispersed nature where 4% infectors cause 80% infections. And essentially it proved that mathematically, we could prove that this aerosol distribution and airborne um, route of the infection could translate to uh, these uh, super spreading events or the statistically, which is reflected by this over, this over dispersed long tail PDFs. And uh, we looked into the school data uh, where the number of people infected in schools, and we could also qualitatively describe those distributions using these uh, distributions that we have obtained. So with that, uh, I would uh, end this talk and I once again thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'd be happy to take uh, questions. So thank you very much, Professor Pongsong.